I wanted to uh, start doing an Instagram live, hopefully every fortnight is what I'm going to aim for. <laughs> and I thought uh, it would be uh, a nice way just to share some knowledge with you. It's quite easy and informal for me, for me to do. When I, when I write one of the articles for my website, it takes a bit of time. But if I can uh, easily answer your questions that you have on your mind at, at points, it's really easy. And maybe I'll be able to invite some other people on as I get to grips with Instagram Live, and then I can have two-way discussions with other people. And uh, Jem, thanks for asking. This is my natural hair. I do do need a haircut. My, my stylist, Isabel, my, my wife has been away for a little bit, but she's back now. So I'll have to chase her up for, for, for a haircut, actually. But it's, uh, it's winter, so I'm not too worried about having short hair. But yeah, so as I say, if you put your questions into the questions bit and then I can answer, I can answer those from there. And it's really great that so many people have joined in. Um, what I will do after this is sort of save this down and then hopefully put a little bit of text with all the questions and then people can come back and uh, have a watch of these at, at a later date. So I've got some questions coming through and uh, hopefully I can, uh, you guys can all see that question that's popped up on the screen. It's my first time, so I'm just getting to grips with this, so bear with me. But someone's asked uh, when, when I started ultra racing, did I get a coach? Uh, would I recommend a coach? It's a really good question. Uh, well, I, before I got into ultra endurance racing, I actually used to be sort of racing on the road um, in a kind of uh, good amateur or semi-professional way. And I had a coach then between sort of 20 and 24, 20, yeah, 20 and 24 for, for doing this. And this was four years uh of racing on the road and it allowed me to learn quite quite a lot. I also spent a lot of time reading sort of published medical journals on, on PubMed, uh, you know, scientific studies that have been done by, by PhDs and things like this. So I, I learned quite a lot. When I got into ultra endurance racing for the first couple of years, I didn't have a coach. I was treating it more as fun rather than as a serious thing, believe it or not. Um, and so I just sort of rode my bike around for, for fun. However, after a couple of years, I, I did get a coach for ultra endurance cycling and, and we worked together for a couple of years. And that was, again, really interesting. And they challenged me and some of the ideas I, I had. So I, I again started to learn and it was good to have someone to question me. I, I then stopped working with a coach again. So after doing a couple of years, I decided that I preferred to just sort of ride my bike how I wanted to ride it. And by this time, I'd been riding kind of full time for six years or so. And I'd kind of learned how my body worked and how my body responded to training and what I needed to do to get, you know, most of my potential out of myself. And I really decided that I just wanted to ride in a way that was fun for me, be autonomous with, with my riding and not be a slave to someone else's training plan or program. I have, however, maintained sort of, let's say a couple of advisors, I wouldn't call them coaches, but these are people that are coaches or science, sports scientists, or, you know, and qualified people that I can go and ask questions of when I need someone to throw some ideas around with or, or get some information. And I think for me, I've found that actually not having a coach who, who prescribes a plan for me, but having a group of trusted and knowledgeable advisors who I can go and bounce my ideas off and learn from them in a more sort of dynamic and partnership way is really valuable for me. This allows me to have the autonomy I want to wake up and see that it's raining or wake up and I, I feel tired and not train or maybe do one easy hour or wake up some days and just feel like I want to go out and ride my bike all day because it's sunny and I just feel like riding into the hills and getting lost. And so I've been able to maintain that and also do something. I think to come back to answer the second part of the question, I would recommend a coach when starting out because I think back to when I started out and I didn't know anything and it's easy to get lost perhaps in some of the fads or the, you know, articles that cycling magazines and other things published saying oh you should be training super hard and you know there's there's the expression you know no pain no gain and all this other stuff that's not suitable for everyone should we say so if you can have someone that that knows about a subject and you can employ them to, to do it for you then it's going to help and benefit you a lot really once you spend a bit of time learning then maybe you can can coach yourself at or just ride to how you, you enjoy riding and in a fun way.
So, yeah, everyone that's putting questions up in, in the comments, if you just go to the right-hand side with the, with the questions button and put a question there specifically, it allows me to then pop it up on the screen. And also it won't get lost in all the comments that are, that are coming through. Uh, I just answer Sammy's thing as, as you ask it now. Do coaches exist for, for bikepacking? I think there are some people who would probably list bikepacking on their re re like coaching resume. I don't think you need a bikepacking specific coach, even if you do bikepacking or, or ultra endurance races, because fundamentally our physiology is pretty similar, regardless of if it's for bikepacking or you know racing the Tour de France. So I think if you have a good coach and you have really good conversations with them, they should be able to work out what you're doing, what the physiological and perhaps the, the mental demands are for that, and then look to be able to give you a training plan and educate you for the skills that you need in a way that's beneficial for you. So I think that's the other thing when looking for a coach, you need to find someone that works for you and is also capable of understanding what you're doing. And, and most people worth their, worth their weight should be able to do that. Let me have a look at some of the other questions. Let's, uh, let's see about answering this one. One by 11 or two by 11, if you could only choose one for gravel setup. It's a really good question. Um, my gravel bike, and I use it in inverted commas because even I don't know what the hell gravel is. So the bike that I would ride, I, I'd call it like an all road bike. So sometimes I ride it on the tarmac, sometimes I ride it off road. And this means that I've got it set up with two, two by 11. So I have a, a two gears on my crank set at the front and then 11 on the back and you might have 12 if you're riding SRAM. I call it an all road bike rather than a gravel bike because for me, if I'm going out riding sort of easier off road terrain, I might be riding on the tarmac as well. And then I will use this bike everywhere. And so I need a wide range of gears to go faster on the tarmac or slower um, off road. So I have it set up two, on, uh, two by on the, on the front with a 50 and a 34, this is this perfect for me. And then an 11 sort of 40 out the back. So quite small, you know, easy gears. I, I really like that. On my mountain bike, which is probably the bike that I ride 95% of the time, my hardtail, I only have uh, one by 12. So I have a 30 up front and a 12 uh, speeds out back. So 10 to 51. And this is more than enough gears on that bike. I ride that bike mostly off-road, although I will ride it on tarmac and I still seem to have enough gears on tarmac. I think for a proper mountain bike and a hardtail, that actually having, and a bike that's set up to ride off-road specifically nearly all the time, having one by up front is, is the best because it's, it's better, it's not gonna get clogged up in mud. You're not gonna have to be shifting so much. If you come around a corner and you, um, and, and, and there's a steep hill, you can just bang through the gears really quickly. So I think for like specific off-road all the time riding, one by up the front with like a 1051 cassette out back is, is more than enough gears for, for most people. If you're riding an all-road bike, so maybe a bit of gravel and a bit of tarmac, then having two by up the front just allows you better range and then maybe you only need one bike, but perhaps with two wheel sets, one for tarmac, one for like all-road. So, yeah, this is an interesting question. What are your thoughts on the consumerism and gear obsession within the world of bikepacking? I feel like I've been seen. Uh, I love kit and I love gear and I love having the best kit and the best gear. So yeah, it's, it's a difficult question. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm always sort of trying to get new stuff, but I will use old stuff until it till it falls apart you know if it's still usable and workable you know i'll sew it up i'll fix it i i won't just go out and buy something new for the sake of it my sleeping bag is about eight years old now does the job i could buy a lighter one a faster one a slightly better one but there's no point in doing so because my old one works perfectly so i just keep using it i do think that there is you know there is benefit to 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 getting better things but perhaps rather than feeling ashamed or, 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 or you know worried about buying something new you could consider like okay can I set a goal that means I, I, I deserve to get something new and then reward yourself for that but then you could consider what can I do with the thing that I'm replacing so if I'm replacing something and the old item is perfectly serviceable I just want something better 
or slightly different because my needs have changed. Most of the time I try and find someone that would benefit from that item that I don't need anymore to give it to. And for me, that's quite a valuable thing to be able to give stuff away to people that need it more than I do. And rather than just selling it, you know, okay, if you need the money, sell it, there's nothing wrong with that. But perhaps if you can do something good with that, with that item to help benefit someone else, then you're gonna feel twice as good because you're gonna get something nice for yourself, you're gonna like that, and you're gonna give something to someone else and help them. So yeah, perhaps don't buy things unnecessarily, but you know, don't, don't be afraid to, to get new things when you do need them and maybe look to have, find some opportunities in, in using older things and, and do something good with them. Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, ride fast and on more sleep versus ride slower and on a little less sleep. A shorter answer, if you want to go to my website in the knowledge section, I wrote about sleep a couple of times now because I really enjoy the subject. I think the answer depends and it depends on the event. If you're doing a mountain bike event with really tough terrain, you're probably going to go faster and be able to ride the technical terrain faster off a bit more sleep because you're going to be more alert, more awake, and it's more demanding. If it's easier terrain, maybe you can get by with a little less sleep and it's not going to impact your speed quite so much. I think it's, it's a fine line and I, I, I'm hesitant to give my own answer because I don't want to sway anyone. You know, I'd say when you're a novice and you're getting new into the sport, you should definitely be sleeping more. It's not the place you should be, you know, pushing the limits first. And then when you are more experienced and you've optimized other areas that are easier to optimize like nutrition, stopped time, you know, when you go to a cafe, go, go to a petrol station instead because it's quicker. When you've started to optimize all of these times, then maybe you can look at optimizing the amount of time that you sleep. But really when you start bringing the amount of time you sleep down to kind of the minimal levels that you can achieve as a person and finding where that line is of, of the minimal or the minimum sleep that you can sustain on, it's gonna go wrong at some point as it has done for me in the past. And that's either gonna mean that you might scratch, you might get injured, you might just not have fun. And the consequences of that are quite high. So I would always urge people to be cautious on how far they cut sleep down. And really, if you're not like pushing at the absolute front, um, you're probably a lot better making sure you're sleeping a little bit more so you're more cognitively alert and then you can optimize the other areas in the race better. You know, I've lost an hour because I've made a stupid mistake, crashed my bike, bent my rear derailleur hanger and had to fix that. Whereas if I'd slept maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes longer, that wouldn't have happened. And so you've got to think of the second order consequences of, of what happens when you sleep less. I'll just answer this one quickly. Do you train for sleep deprivation? Because it follows on. Uh, again, if you go to the website, look at the knowledge articles. I mentioned this in one of them. I don't think you can train specifically for sleep deprivation, like you can't just, you know, go onto PubMed and read an article on training for sleep deprivation. But I think the best way to train for sleep deprivation is to experience it, to understand it and know what effect it has on you. But the other thing is that the effect is always going to change. So you need to experience sleep deprivation to understand it so that you can be effective under it and put a plan in place for when you're going to be going through sleep deprivation. Arguably the best way to do that is just doing an event because then you get to do an event as well and, and learning through through events. You can maybe do that for one night through, you know, riding through one night completely and, and seeing how that goes. Um, but ultimately you can't train for it. You need to experience it, understand it, and then you can handle it in the, in the best way possible for you. But just be aware like even for me, every time I become sleep deprived, it's a bit different and things are different. So you need to sort of experience it a few times to really start understanding the scale and the scope of what, what might happen. God, there's loads of questions. So um, I'll just do this one. What are your plans for 2022 TCR again? No, at the moment, I'm not, not gonna do TCR. Hopefully it does go ahead. I'm really, really hopeful for, for Lost Art and Transcontinental and everyone that's entered that in the past couple of years that it will go ahead in 2022. For me, my plans in 2022 are actually to sort of repeat 2021 because I had a pretty bad year this year. I didn't achieve things to the level I wanted to. And I decided that uh, 
I want to go back to the Highland Trail 550 again to repeat that and to see what I'm really capable of there. And then I'm going to put in an application, and this reminds me that I need to do that actually for Silk Road Mountain Race, and hopefully get to actually ride the event this year rather than uh, the mess up that was 2021. So those are going to be my two big events in May and then in August, Highland Trail 550 and Silk Road Mountain Race. And then we will see what happens um, in the smaller events around that. I just see a comment about Shama's neck. Just remember, if you want to ask a question, just put it in the question thing rather than comments. But if you go on my website to the knowledge section, there's a big thing on there on Shama's neck. And uh, it's a lot better to go and read that than me and try and repeat that now because I will uh, not give you such good information. Um, Hardtail or drop bar rigid mountain bike on a mountain bike race such as French Divide? Yeah, I think you've answered your own question, haven't you? I would um, ride a hardtail. I, if you're going to ride a hardtail or sort of like um, a, what I'd call a monster cross or a big gravel bike, really they're both going to have the same tires on them, aren't they? Because you're going to be riding some sort of, you know, 29 or 2.25, you know, we'll use um, imperial measurements tires xc ones and they'll be the same on both so probably just ride either whichever one you have or the one that's most comfortable for you i ride my hardtail all the time because i don't see it being any slower than riding a uh, drop bar bike but when i get to a descent i can descend a lot better with wide flat bars and brakes in front of me than i can on a uh, drop bars and it's just a personal preference thing for me and i'm very accustomed to riding that bike now because i ride it most days for, for the last couple of years and I just enjoy riding it. So I think the hardtail is the most versatile bike you can have. Um, and I, I wouldn't be without mine nowadays. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's my favorite thing. I would add that I haven't ridden the French Divide, but I've seen uh, the bikes that come out of that and sort of understand the terrain for that. And that's how I come about the question and a bit about for, from other things. Um, this is kind of a, a quick uh, question. Do you add sort electrolytes? Uh, in the past, I didn't. These days, yes, I do. Depending on the event, I will be taking electrolytes with me. Some uh, like the tabs that come in the plastic tube and I'll put them in. I obviously run out after if it's a really long race and then you can get sort, sachet, sort sachets from places. If you're doing a tarmac event, you'll be able to stop at petrol stations all the time and buy sort of the small drinks that have the electrolytes in them. Um, I, I found personal benefit, like um, anecdotally, to to doing so when I do events, but we're all different. We all sweat salt at different amounts, and so you need to sort of understand how that works for you. But yes, yes, I do, um, and I have found benefit from that. Uh, I've got loads of questions. Uh, yeah, this kind of is a wide ranging question. What would you start with if you want to start in bikepacking? I think back to when I started bikepacking and what I did was I just packed up some bikes on my bag with not really much idea and just went off on a trip and it went from there. And I think that's the best way you can start. Don't, you know, go to a shop and buy all this stuff or get, all, you know, I had some panniers and I had a steel bike and whatever. And I just went off on a trip. So you know, a huge tent, you know, so go and borrow some stuff, beg it, you know, it doesn't need to be the best. It just needs to be something, pack your bike up, plan some kind of route, but just get out there and experience it. And you're going to start learning the, the hard way and it's going to be loads of fun. Ultimately, you're going to have fun and that fun will sort of draw you back into doing more bike packing. And from there, you can start learning and getting serious if you want to, but ultimately it's those it's those early days where you're just out having fun and experiencing things for the first time that are magical. And uh, yeah, the, the, the other thing would be to, to just find some like-minded people to go bikepacking with. Maybe you know someone who's done it before, or perhaps you, know, you want to kind of find a group of other people who want to go bikepacking with you if you're you know, not wanting to do it by yourself. And, and those are definitely things that you can do. Uh, Yeah, this is this is a, a kind of short Trans Am bike race. So Trans Am bike or Tour Divide, which one would you take on next? Trans Am bike race goes uh, west to east or east to west, and it's on tarmac. And Tour Divide goes north to south, Banff to to Mexico, and that is off road. 
I think you're going to understand which one I would take on next and it would definitely be the Tour Divide and the Tour Divide is very much like on my list of events to do. You know, COVID has perhaps prevented me from that and I have some unfinished business at Silk Road Mountain Race. But I think for me, Tour Divide is, is sitting up there as one of the things that I've got my mind on next. I just need to tick some boxes off and then I can look to really go and focus myself on, on that magical event and I can't wait to go and experience it, it out there. Yeah, so someone's asked a question about my, my, my event, uh, Les Ferri de, del Bikepacking, and the event itself, Les Ferri de Girona. Applications actually opened that today, so I'm definitely going to plug that right here right now. If you're not following that, you can go and follow that uh, from my bio. There's a link in there, please do. Why is there so much climbing? Um, because it's Catalonia, there, there are lots of hills, and it's unavoidable to avoid the hills. And Ultimately, in the end of the day, if you go to the top of the hill, you get an absolutely amazing view and then you get to go down the hill as well. So there are benefits to climbing hills. I really like climbing. I think it's just the way the landscape is here. And if you want to come here and enjoy it, then you're going to have to climb. And it's tough, you know. <laughs> the, uh, the idea behind it was the fact that I've just been here and living in, in Catalonia and in Girona and riding around here for the past year. And I've been... Um, mesmerized by it and over the past year this sort of you know vision has come to me and I, I just kind of conceived the idea for this route as I've been riding and exploring in different places and I just thought it'd be amazing to link all these things up and send a bunch of people out there to experience it and hopefully that they can experience the same sort of fulfillment and magic that I do when I'm out riding my bike here and when I'm uh, doing events in other places so it's a way to give back hopefully What are the key qualifications for becoming a fast ultra cyclist? What's per kilogram of physiological strength? Good question. And I think you've, you've sort of nailed two things. Um, I think there's probably a couple more. You need to have self-resilience and problem-solving skill. I think that's really important to... to uh, to be able to solve problems, because if, you, if you're super fast and, and you're super strong mentally, but you can't solve problems, then maybe that's going to slow you down. I think you need resilience as well, because things will go wrong in, in events. And perhaps that comes under psychological strength to, to have resilience. I think probably you need to be humble as well. That, and that might be sound interesting, but I think it's such a hard and such a serious undertaking not just to train for the event but to actually do one of the events that it might not necessarily go right in the first time or you might have setbacks and you need to be humble about your sort of you're humble about your desires and your wants going into that event you know like if you're going to finish i'm going to finish first i'm going to i'm going to be really great i'm going to ride for 23 hours a day and sleep for 30 minutes and, and it's your first event something's probably going to go wrong because of that and as I say earlier on when answering the sleeping question, if you sort of went in and be like, right, I'm going to sleep for two and a half hours because I know that that's a really good amount and then I will ride as much on top of that as I can, it gives you that mental attitude. So it's about having that attitude and, and towards being humble. Now, you ask what's per kilogram. So what's per kilogram is just how kind of fast you are in, in, in layman's, layman's terms and, and then physiological strength. I think if you consider it like high stakes poker, having a big engine and being fast buys you a seat at the table. You, you do need that to sort of play at the front, so to speak, of, of, of an event. But then really everyone playing at the front is probably on a similar level of terms of fast and just how fast they are isn't gonna make a massive difference. What would then make the difference on whether you come, you know, finish first, second, third, fourth, fifth, you know, however, is your physiological strength, your mental resilience, your problem solving, your humility, they're, they're what's going to decide the things. And perhaps just if you have bad luck, sometimes, sometimes bad things happen, but also it's kind of preparation as well, um, how prepared you are. And, you know, bad luck will happen to people that are 
unprepared or less prepared more often than people who are very well prepared. You know, if you've forgotten one specific tool in your little tool bag on your bike, something goes wrong in an event and you don't have that tool to fix, you know, the really weird thing that went wrong, you might go, oh, that's bad luck, but it's not really bad luck. It's, it's poor preparation. And, and so I'd add that to the list of other things as well. So hopefully that kind of answers the question, but there's a, there's a lot to it. And I think as the events get harder, that there is more, there are more things to it as well, but it's, it's a really, it's a really interesting question. Yeah, this is this is a good question. How how do you work on the mental challenges of injury or having to scratch from a race? I think this is a this is a really interesting question and it kind of hits home at the moment because 2021 was a uh, a difficult year for me. I had an injury in February and then it sort of plagued me all year. So I kind of had to train through that and go to events while having that injury, knowing that I was nowhere near my uh, top level. It, 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 it's a difficult one. I think there's no one answer to it and it depends upon the person and upon the injury. I think you have to start looking at long-term rather than short-term when, when you have an injury. And if you focus on the short-term, it's, it's going to seem difficult and I think if you're used to cycling every day and training every day but then you've got an injury you need to take that attitude that you have to training and sort of living a good life and, and wanting to do an event and sort of reimpose it or rewrite it onto the injury and for example if you have a muscular injury and you need to be doing physiotherapy and doing some exercises and foam rolling and stretching and these other things every day to then look after your injury well, that just sort of becomes your training. And it's a bit different to wanting to go out cycling, but you can then start to put the energy and the enthusiasm and the commitment that you would have had to into the cycle training into the injury training. And it gives you something to look forward to and a goal to work towards, goal to work towards. And sort of, you know, you can use the progress of the injury getting better to stay motivated and excited. And, and sort, sort of put some markers in the ground for, oh, I hope to be, you know, be able to walk well by this point. You know, when I finished an event a couple of years ago, I, I couldn't really walk because I had a, a strain on my ACL and uh, bone bruising around my knee. So I, I couldn't walk upstairs and I could barely walk, um, you know, from, from the bed to the kitchen for, for a couple of weeks. But I started doing the physio and the rehab and rest, rested, obviously, and it just took time. And so I had to refocus what I wanted and to remember that and eventually things do get better but sometimes they can take a really long time to get better and I think the scratching is a different point but it sort of comes back to the same thing and it is mental resilience and the ability to kind of refocus to bounce back to to put new goals in place and and stay positive in the times of you know ad adversity and, and these are really profound life skills and this is why I've sort of tried to explain sometimes that actually just doing ultra endurance events uh, races big bike packing trips getting out there doesn't just make you good at doing those things actually all of the skills that you learn there transform into real life so you know say a really profound and devastating life event happens to you you can draw on those difficult times to bring to that and so perhaps you know, if you do have to scratch from a race, rather than being dejected about it, what happened when I scratched was I started to think, well, okay, what went wrong? What could I get better next time? And how can I do that? And you just try and look at things in a, rather than a negative, like, oh, I'm stupid, you know, talking about myself personally for making these mistakes. I just say, well, this went wrong. There's nothing that I can do about that now. But the best thing that I can do is to try and learn from that for the future. So maybe you got injured. You could try and understand why you had that injury and then just try and prevent that injury from next time. But then you might be able to think, well, if I got that injury, what injuries might I get next time? And what can I do now to prevent those injuries? And so it's just about like reframing what's happened and trying to find a positive outlook on that to take it forward with you in a, in a constructive way. You know, you don't necessarily have to be happy that you scratched, but if you can be constructive about it going wrong and take that forward, then you can do well.
And I sort of answered a question earlier on about being humble and, and goal setting into an event. And I think if you've had a, a humble goal coming into the event, it, it's going to help. So I'll go into an event often now with the goal to just simply do my best that I can do in that event. And that's quite, it's quite an open goal and it allows you room to, to find sort of like to find something from that no matter what's happened. So perhaps you didn't, weren't able to finish the event, but you could still take solace in that you did your best in that event. Okay, maybe you had a knee injury and, you know, it didn't go exactly how you wanted, but you did your best and then you had to call it a day and you can still look back and be happy with that. And I think that's a really important thing. So if you've been able to set good goals in the beginning and then can reflect on them in a positive light and be constructive, then you can deal with something that could potentially be quite negative, like scratching, in a really positive way. And that's quite a long answer, but it's a really, really interesting topic. And I think it's it really digs into the sort of mental side of this, which I find fascinating. And uh, I'm just looking at the time. I think uh, I will bring this to an end now because we've been half an hour already and I could probably talk all evening. Um, but it's been really good fun for me and, and thank you for coming and asking some questions. It's, it's been great to have some people. I will do this again in a fortnight. So if you've got more questions or you want to pick a topic up more, then, then please do. What I would do is then post this video to my, my feed. And so if you want to pick something up with some more questions, we, we can do that there and I, I'd be happy to keep the conversation going. So. Uh, Thank you everyone very much for coming. I hope that perhaps you've, you've learned something from this, found it interesting, maybe you could take something away, think about it a bit more, and uh, we keep the conversation going. So, cheers.